Hi there, welcome to the Dram Team's latest stream, and this is, of course, the Shiny Box. Uh, I am Vin PF of No Nonsense Whiskey, and today, of course, is Chris, and uh, I'm actually the wrong way around again. We did set this up the other way around. Let's flick that around again. There we go. I don't know why that <laughs> happens. Never mind. Um, hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm very well, Vin. Uh, thank I was going to say thank you for having me, but uh, thank you for joining us uh, since we're on our channel today instead of me being on yours for once. So, uh, yeah, thank you for setting all this up and hosting us. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure entirely, because we're going to try some uh, good rye today, which is something that um, we were just talking about a little bit earlier. I'm no expert in rye. Uh, I've tried a few, uh, not any of these before, actually, which is good. I'm looking forward to trying these. I've got mine lined up back here in the empty bottles just in front. Um, but yeah, how about you? What you would like with rye? Well, it's a weird one, because we, we were just talking about this before that we started the live stream. Neither of us know a lot about it. So what I do know about it is that I really like it. And so it's weird in some ways for me that I've liked it a lot for quite a while and not, not actually known much about it. Now, in some ways, that's more to do with, for, for, for the business, what we do with the Dram team is more focused on other categories closer to single malt scotch. So that's tends to be what we read about, write about, talk about with our product more often. So we probably just haven't, I think we've had one or two rise in four or five years now. So I think probably that's the reason. Uh, but the good thing is, I know that I really like it. So for me, this is a, a really good lineup to, to tuck into. Mm, awesome. Yeah, I mean, for me, my um, my road with rye has been, uh, been a rocky one, I'll admit. Um, the same with peat, to be fair. When I first started drinking whiskey, I didn't like peat. Um, and when I first tried my first rye, I didn't like that. Um, but I've plugged away at it and I've uh, found some really good ryes that I've enjoyed. But I think that's that's the kind of key to stuff like this, because it's, it's a very strong flavour if you're not, kind of naturally disposed to that i think it's probably fair to say yeah i mean it's a little fiery but um actually it, it, and, I, and i think my main experience of when we did taste our way through this lineup prior to christmas myself and and harry who's our head of marketing at the dram team and actually chose this lineup and we'll, we'll talk a bit about more more about that in a minute but we tasted our way through it and i just remember being overwhelmed by how peppery and spicy everything was the first time around and it took a while for your palate to adjust and get used to to that level of spice. Um, I can see we've already got a few people popping into the, the chat bin. Uh, so yeah, first of all, a few people. Dave Worthington. So Dave's a very special guest. Not only have I known him for quite a long time through what they do with the Dram Team and back in a time when such things happened, seeing him at uh, whiskey festivals all over the UK. So he works for the, the Batiki Whiskey Company, an award-winning brand ambassador for them, no less. Wonderful beard and often a, i think a tricorner hat I, I don't know if i feel like i might be making that up now i've said it out loud but um so you'll see tonight we've got a couple of uh boutique rye company drams so um hopefully dave will be able to drop a few gems of knowledge to to make you and me look a little bit less clueless uh straight into the chat and um give us something to talk about uh, I see we've got a whisk guy here as well so these are a couple of chaps who are dra long-term dram teamers and have a podcast called whisk guy on youtube where they talk through our boxes every now and then and we've got mike and top whiskers are here as well so i think how many people we've got in total been uh we've got 15 watching on youtube i'm not sure on facebook the metrics come across but if you are watching on facebook then make sure you let us know below because we can see both those sets of comments and we obviously want to include everybody in the conversation so yeah please do let us know if you're watching on facebook so i would, I would absolutely encourage anyone if you've got if you're Dave and you've got interesting facts, please chip in. <laughs> if you're anyone else, if you've bought the box, if you've got tasting notes, if you've got uh, questions about rye, about the distilleries, ask them. Can't guarantee that me and Vin will know the answers, uh, but I did do a little bit of reading in advance. And we also have, from the Dram team, Harry. So Harry uh, chose the, the rye in this box. She uh, curated the lineup. So it's actually the first Dram team lineup that I didn't actually uh, select for the, for the first time ever. Um, Anyway, Ben, I, should, I could talk more about the box in a minute. Um, do you think we should tuck into the first dram before uh, everyone gets too thirsty? Absolutely. I mean, uh, we've always found, I don't know if you've done many tastings, but I've always found that getting into the first one is important and then do the pitches afterwards. Yes, let's do that then. So the first one, for those of you who are joining us uh, with, with the box, uh, we're drinking in box order, left to right. Um, Hopefully and the the first one. One, it, so it should be... And it should also be the first card in your little pack is the East London Liquor Company, London Rye. 
Well, I would say about this one, first of all, one thing, as well as liking rye whiskey, one other thing that I really like is fancy bottles. And this one, you, I don't know how well you can make it out, but this is a sort of cube of a bottle. It's a big weighty sort of brick with a really solid, that cap is like solid, heavy metal. It feels really good in the hand. Um, so that's quite a distinctive and different bottle this one comes in. It's, I think it's a good way to start as well, because for me, it's not, I mean, you, you can tell it's quite like that, that fiery spiciness, but it, it's a nice, easy way in, I think. Nice, easy way in. Well, I think for me, rye is sort of a drink of two halves because it's got that spicy pepperiness, that, that the heat that's sort of associated with it, you alluded to it earlier. But it's also quite sweet often, mm. uh, which I quite like. Um, and so, but the two are sort of sometimes not fighting each other, but they're quite distinctively different ends of the spectrum for me, the sweet and the pepperiness and the spice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, as you would see from the cards, this one's, uh, it's a, a lot more barley than it is rye still. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, in America, they have some rules about sort of 51% and stuff like that, but this is a 42% rye and 58% malted barley, which is, you know, it's a good way of going, but this one's got a lot of weird and wonderful cask types going into it as well. Whereas ordinarily you'd probably just have one cast type kind of virgin oak, um, which is giving it that kind of extra dynamic that um, for me is, is, is easing me into the rye flavor profile. As I said earlier, it's, it's a struggle for me sometimes, but this has got such a wonderful nose on it. So for those of you who have, have the tasting cards, it will say on it what the barrel mix is. The text is quite small on this one. Um, little side note on the tasting cards so we were talking before the chat again about what um what makes a shiny edition a shiny edition and i'll talk more about that in a minute but one of the little wrinkles that i was really glad to know that vin noticed because i wasn't sure that anyone would notice is that if you hold your card up to the light and you sort of wave it a little bit you can see that it's it's shot through with a little bit of gold a little gold foiling so we didn't go quite full shiny sort of hogs or, or football uh, card shiny with the silver reflective holograms that sort of thing but there is a little bit of a shiny gold wrinkle into the into the the tasting cards dave's asked a question is it uh rye malted or unmalted it's malted um which you know I, i'm not sure how weird that is or if it's weird or not um but yeah malted it is hmm now, um, we should say as well, I don't know if any if people are subscribers of the Dram team. Um, if you are, obviously, you'll know the, the routine here. But um, typically, these are tasting notes taken from the, um, the from the manufacturers, right? They are indeed. And that, that is the case here. So these are the original producer tasting notes where they exist. There was one on here, actually, which um, I did. I've got the websites um, pulled up here. I really enjoyed this when I was first <laughs> looking at it. Um, the team tasting notes here. So I don't think any of these are actually covered off in the official tasting notes. But the team tasting notes, this is the team at East London Liquor, uh, vary from candied orange peel, sour cherry candies, toffee apples, chili peppers, and this is the, the best bit, and even one desk drawer, but in a good way. <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> desk drawer. I was like, that's quite a variable tasting note because to me I immediately think of sort of that old, you know, like a leather topped desk. Maybe it smells a little bit fusty almost. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that was here. So maybe it's more like a fresh, uh, a fresh modern drawer, not, uh, not an old fusty drawer. But that, that could be, you can see there's quite a lot of variety in those taste notes. But as you said, Vin, the, the, the cast mix is quite diverse. You've got virgin oak in there, but it's virgin French oak. Uh, and then you've got virgin chestnut casks which is quite unusual there's not very many whiskies i've come across that were matured in uh, chestnut casks i think there's a method of madness irish one that i know I, I can't think of any of those off the top of my head um str which is shaved toasted and recharred uh, so that literally for those of you who haven't come across an str cask before it, they literally shave the inside of the cask they toast it as in put flame up through the middle of the the cask uh, and, and char it so um and then sherry and bourbon which obviously more normal in in, in scotch but perhaps less so in, in rye uh, particularly because most people's experience of rye is like to have been u.s rye like american rye mm. um and i 
now I was about to say this and now I'm not confident, but certainly with bourbon, they have to use virgin oak for um for bourbon. And I believe the same holds true for American rye. But um now I've said that out loud, I'm not completely confident, but I think that was a general rule about American whiskies. Uh, certainly is for bourbon. Well, uh, Mike certainly gets the uh, the good desk <laughs> Mike's definitely getting some pencil shavings off this. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about the, the tasting notes is that they really are all subjective. Um, even the manufacturers who make it would say whatever they personally feel. So, you know, if it makes you think of a, of a, of a bygone age, then that's your mm. association. Um, my favorite example of that is uh, the, the Dalmore 12. I always say this. It, um, it reminds me of eating the little raisins you've got in those little red packets, the little um, sun-made raisins. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it reminds me of eating those as a kid. So it has like a, a special place for me, even though I don't buy it very often. But yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, Jake's saying, good first pick. And I think this is definitely going to be a good introduction to rye, especially, um, I have to say, we'll, we'll be getting onto it later, but the last one, the sixth dram, um, is, is actually the only one I've tried before. And it's a little bit special. I do like that. It is a special one. So it's, it's interesting that... You, it's a good introduction because in some ways it is and it isn't so the, i would say it's a good introduction because it has quite a lot of malted barley in it so in some ways it's, it's bring it closer towards whiskies that people are more likely to be familiar with uh and then actually in some ways the quite diverse cask mix is also gonna not dilute down but uh reduce the purity certainly of the right the, the, the straight rye and some of the others are going to be well, i don't know how you if you could say this but more normal rice that we'll come to <laughs> later on um, whereas this is quite unusual, uh, but that does mean that it might be more like other whiskies that you've tried in, a, in the uh, in the past and less like pure rye. So as an introduction, that could work. Um, I'm not a hundred, but I, I get this. I like the smell of this. I do find the palate. I just can't settle on whether I'm. It feels like it almost tastes different every time I take a sip of it. Mm, I get that. Hmm. But this is, um, I think this is the third of their um, London Rise, um, the third edition. It was, uh, I think it was a 2020 edition. So I think this is only released sort of back in October, November time. Uh, so we got it fairly hot off the press. Um, oh, I'm really pleased to say that Dave has said it's a new whiskey discovery for him. I think uh, back when we started the Dram Team five years ago, Dave was doing a lot of uh, whiskey blogging. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the blog was called Whiskey Discovery. And it took me several boxes before I managed to send him a whiskey he hadn't already tried. So if you get a whiskey that Dave's not tried before, you're doing pretty well. Uh, so uh, maybe the shiny edition's um, going to do a few of those. Definitely. I mean, uh, uh, that's ton of the night as well. Can we get the whisk guy up on there? Yeah, definitely. First, I based pun of the evening. Fully and wholeheartedly encourage people to come up with as many rye puns as they can. I'm sure we, I'll uh, just say hello to Dom, who we've got in the chat. So Dom's a, a, a local Bristol fella, um, part of a local club here. And uh, I know he likes a dad joke. If anyone wants a good steady stream of dad jokes, uh, they make me chuckle, I'm ashamed to say. It must be my age showing. Um, follow Dom on, on Twitter, because <laughs> he's got some really good Twitter jokes going. I think that's his sole purpose on Twitter, right? Just to, just to do bad jokes. Twitter is a force for good, Vin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've seen another familiar face as well. We've got Whiskey Straight Al. So he's another whiskey blogger that's also a long term uh, dram teamer. So I'll be interested to see what Al makes of the, uh, the rye. Mm. Yeah. Have you got the pack of there, um, Al? Hopefully you have. Right, right on there, Chris. <laughs> yeah. One thing I would say that if you, if you are new to rye, I find it takes water quite nicely. It can take the edge off some of the spice and the, the pepperiness and the heat and bring out a little bit of the sweetness. So I wouldn't be afraid to sort of put a little, certainly a good splash of water in, in these. Yeah, why not? I'm going to go and pour. I've got three pours, so I'm going to go ahead and pour um, Dram 4. Uh, that was my, would be my other tip for these, is that they do well if they stand a little bit. Again, it just sort of lets them, I was going to say relax, I don't know if that's a, the right word, but they sort of mellow out a little bit if they've been in the glass a little bit longer. Yeah, I think so too. I poured these out something like uh, like 40 minutes ago now, I guess. Yeah, um, because it, exactly that, you know, it's uh, it's a... 
you've got to be careful with it because you know some people will, will see you swilling like that i'm doing it now just to show you but it's um it's one of those ones where you, you kind of you want to chill out on that a little bit um i'm actually i'm getting some of these sherry elements coming through now now that it's been sat there for a while i've added a bit of water to that just a wee touch of sulfuriness to it which you know anyone who watches my channel will know that i'm very sensitive to that a bit gunpowdery I was going to ask if you're ready to move on to the second one, then. <laughs> it looks like you're really yeah. enjoying yourself still. No, I think so. Um, definitely up for that. Uh, let me. I've got got me water. Hopefully, everyone's got some water as well. It's, we've got a lot of drams to get through today. Yeah, I think with the rye again, with that peppery heat, the water mm. will be more necessary than usual. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Dave in the comments there he says, uh, and this is something we were talking about just off off screen beforehand. Yeah. Um, I actually have a bottle of Sonoma rye, not the one that we're going to be trying in this box, but the, the standard rye. And I have been demolishing it in the past few months, mainly because of having rye old fashioned. So I firmly agree with Dave on that one. So we've got a question as well. I just see a pop up there from Villas. Um, do we know what the proportions of each cask are? No, I don't actually. Um, it was a relatively limited release. So there wouldn't be too much opportunity to to blend a huge number of different casts. So I'd imagine it might be reasonably even, but um, I'm yeah. not quite certain on the release numbers in terms of how many bottles it was. So it looks like it's quite limited. It says it, um, 1,200. Um, so I, I imagine, uh, you know, at the very least, obviously one of each, but I'd, I'd probably maybe, yeah. um, I'm just trying to guess now, maybe the French oak, well, how many types have we got? We may be able to uh, work this one out for you, Villa. So we've got virgin French oak, virgin chestnut, STR, sherry, and expert. So we've got five casts in 1,200 bottles. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if that was one of each. Mm. Um, it, you'd probably get 200. Ooh. It depends on the cask size, but broadly sort of 200 bottles per cask, 200 to 300 wouldn't be abnormal. Um it's not very strong. It's probably not cast strength, but it's not 40% either. So I, I would guess one of each would, would be my best guess at that. Um, and what it doesn't say is whether it's been aged in one and then gone into another, for example. So more of a finish or a, a maturation half in one cast than another. But from the way it reads, I would guess one of each cask would be my best bet. Mm. Yeah, I reckon so. Um, I've just had a cheeky sip of the second one, and it's... Uh... It's a big hitter. Um, so, I think, yeah, let's move on to that. It's the first of the boutique ones today. So um, please bombard Dave with all of your inquiries because, uh, I mean, we like boutique here. Um, I, I'm a big fan. They do a, a massive variety of stuff, so you can always find something. Uh, and the first one we're going to do is peerless. So I say that again, Chris. I picked up on an incidental rye pun. You sounded like you were everything, the variety of the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's my bad. Really um, you need to rename your channel Whisk Rye briefly, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, okay. Dave, we're going to do the Peerless. Peerless. Do next. Peerless. Peerless, yeah. Uh, we're so doing you, box order, so it's... Um, yeah, so uh, second dram in is the Boutique Peerless. Uh, both the Boutique ones are three years old. Mm -hmm. um, fairly normal with rye, I think, for it to be younger generally speaking um i don't know if that's because historically it's predominantly from from the us and warmer parts of the us so like bourbon it doesn't tend to get matured as long uh, i'll be interested to know if um rise from you know we've got a finnish rye in here um we've got coming up i think a danish rye uh, obviously they're a little bit cooler so it might be that down the line there's a relatively new distilleries i think that they might do some older rides so um yeah next up we've got the Boutique Rye Company Peerless. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is grab the full size bottle since I have it here. Because one thing I really like about all of Boutique's bottlings mm. um, is they are not afraid of doing a really cool label. So this is a picture of the actual distillery. And I think three generations of the family that, um, are the, uh, well, I assume are the distillers actually, but the, so the family that own and run the distillery. Uh, actually, for, as by boutique standards, a relatively low-key label is often they're more cartoony and have some excellent visual puns in them and things like that. But uh, they're quite distinctive anyway compared to more traditional whiskey labels. Um, 
So, should, have you have you said you tried some bin? What do you make? Yeah. Of? Well, so th I mean, this is probably more of a classic um, rye than than the first, um, and there's only actually two. Just counting. Uh, technically, there's two American ryes here because I think Whistlepig is a bit of a, a strange one because it's, I think it's actually Canadian or what, well, and it's shipped around a bit. But anyway, um, so this is a probably a, a more classic rye that you would get if you went and bought a proper rye, you know, straight rye. Yeah, and I'll say straight off the bat, this is much more my cup of tea than mm. the first one was. So we've got Dave chipping in here that this is a, a high rye whiskey, so 60 to 65% rye. So for those of you who are from more of a Scotch background, uh, single malt Scotch is made exclusively with malted barley, right? So it's 100% malted barley. By definition, it has to be. So the thing about rye whiskey is it's, it's actually rarely 100% rye. Uh, and the reason for that is that rye is quite difficult to work with from a distilling standpoint. Um, it's just not as easy to break down uh, and to, to ferment and then to distill. So often it's mixed in, as we'll see as we go through the drams, with proportions of other grains that are more easy to work with from a distillation point of view. So in that first case, we saw that, was it 52% of the, the, East, the London rye was malted barley versus 48% rye? Now, for an American rye to be a rye, it has to be at least 51% rye in the mash bill. And then they'd mix it in with other grains like corn, such as just used to make bourbon and things like that. Oh, and Dave indeed is in saying uh, it's all unmalted rye and corn and malted barley make up the rest of the mash bill. Thank you, Dave. Always good to have an expert on hand, right? <laughs> oh, and Dave's even giving us information on the, the three gentlemen on the label. First fourth and fifth generation family members from the distillery on the label there it's a real historic family affair i really like this one this is yeah. um going back to what we talked about with cocktails this would make a great great old-fashioned for me and what's good about the old-fashioned is the dilution with the ice melting and the slight sweetness uh that you get in from either stirring in the sugar or using the simple syrup sugar syrup uh, it, it all takes up the edge off the heat and the pepperiness and brings out all the lovely, sweet, warming flavours. Mm. I mean, this one's really sweet, I think, really sweet, um, which for me is a winner. I quite like a sweet a sweet um, whiskey. But it's, yeah, it's really hot, um, really spicy. Mm. So Dom has asked us if rye whiskey improves with age like a single malt mile, does it depend on mash milk? I don't know if it depends on the mash bill. I guess it depends on a lot of things, um, climate, cask. So I'm going to completely dodge that question, <laughs> basically, and say I don't know. And I would speculate that it varies in a lot of things. So I think the whistle pig's going to be an interesting taste, test case mm -hmm. for that. The young whistle pig is really good. But certainly when we get to the 15, you'll see that it's a different, it's almost a different style of whiskey. It's quite, yeah it's very just you can tell that it's old is how i would i would say it now of yeah. course i told it was old if i didn't know it was old or was that just me being incepted by the label not sure uh, but i think you can to me it has the characteristics of a better aged whiskey or by longer age is really what i mean um yeah so let's see when we get to the 15 what people make of that and if you would agree with what i've just said i think for my money um it it's just like uh like a peated whiskey it um it it's the most peated it's going to taste at the start and then over time if you if you just put it in a normal barrel if you put it in a fancy extra smoked one then fair enough it might be a bit different but um if you just put it in normal ex bourbon barrel uh, it's going to lose its its heavy peat over time uh, and i think that happens with rye as well it kind of mellows out a little bit as it gets older but it's um yeah as dave's saying here uh rye is rarely aged for a long time yeah um, not sure why. I think maybe the oak influence heavies it well, down it, a bit. So, it, like bourbon, a lot of it's in warm places, and it just it almost not, I wouldn't say it would spoil, but you don't get a lot of very old bourbon because actually, it just it, it, it goes past its best like after some amount of time because of the climate and the fact that you're in virgin oak is it, quite a strong influence of the cask because it's virgin. Um, so. You know, compared to a maybe a class that's been refilled and stored in a cold place in Scotland, obviously it's that that maturation could take much longer in that environment. So, and indeed, when we look at Whistlepig, it's in Vermont, so it's 
more cold there, right? So maybe they're able to age it longer. So I think it's something that actually might come, as I said, with different countries now being on board and right, and it's sort of spreading out beyond the US. Maybe we'll find that out in well, in 10 years' time, <laughs> when everyone's had long enough to actually go and uh, to go and age it for that long. Um I'm a yeah, uh I, I we've got um I just saw in the chat, so I'm getting distracted there. Dave's put a good fact in there about the cooperage. So they work with a local cooperage, the Peerless Distillery. Um, so what we like to hear really, isn't it? People who care about the things they're doing to make their spirit and sourcing good casks. I, I, Dave, you're gonna have to fill me in what a honey cask is. Is that a, a type yeah, of honey. Is it is it anything to do with actual honey? Uh, I hope so. I, I think I could go for a honey, like a uh, you know, mm. cask. You know they season sherry casks with sherry for the whiskey industry. I, I think I could go for a honey seasoned cask. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I, I quite like. Um, if we're talking about like you know, honey uh, whiskey liqueurs like Jack Daniels stuff. I, I quite like them. They're, I mean, they're very sweet, but they've got their place in the world, and um, in, I, I really like them when I try them. I couldn't drink it every day, but um, but when I go for it, I go for it. It's nice. Um, hopefully that's what's given the sweetness to here. So what Dave's also filling us in, which is something that Harry was talking about just prior to the to the live stream um, mm. that she came across when she was researching the drams in the box. So the original Peerless Distillery was lost during Prohibition, which as you might imagine, a lot were. Um, and so it was then brought back, kind of, I wouldn't say, I was gonna say Phoenix, but brought back to life uh, later on. So, um, no honey. <laughs> no honey. <laughs> ah, as in honey is like a special. Like a cherry picked cask, right? Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of that. For me, that is the first one I found a bit disorientating because I wasn't really certain what it was I was tasting between the different casks and the, quite the high portion of malted barley. I like it, but for me, this is more a good, a kind of mainstream, really excellent, tasty rye whiskey. Dave's laughing. Hopefully not at uh, our complete ineptitude with knowledge about what's going on, but <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> Dave, can you make arrangements for a honey seasoned cask, please? <laughs> I don't want to see that. If I see Boutique release that in the next uh, year or two, I'll know that that was my idea. <laughs> Definitely. I think um, out of the two so far, it's like um, like you said, actually. I mean, I quite, I quite like the first one. Um, it's eased me into it with uh, a little bit of... Of, of weirdness and a bit of scotch like nature straight into a proper rye and i have to say really enjoyed that one um wasn't sure if i was going to i have to admit but it's it, it's just really good <laughs> it's just really good um hopefully it will compare nicely to the other ones because we've got uh, a couple of um i want to say scandinavia probably nordic is probably the best way of saying those two next coming up uh, and uh, then the, la the the last of the american ones is not a normal normal rye either so interesting flavor concepts but i don't know if you want to jump onto the third one um but uh, maybe we should talk about the shiny box first what about so the, idea? About the shiny box i'm just gonna talk about how great this smells so i think this one stood out for me when i tasted it before because it's, mm. it's really strong a sort of floral herbal like bouquet on the nose like it's it's really pronouncedly different um to the other two so far yeah this is like um it's like hay hay like multi yeah. and there's a biscuitiness in there as well it's got a really interesting and fascinating nose so i think of all the rice so as i said i'll talk about the shiny dish in a minute but um i've wanted to do rye january basically ever since i started the, the dram team because i like puns way more than someone should like puns Right, dry January, rye January. Now, as it happens in this case, because of being so busy leading into Christmas, thank you, Whisk, whisk Rye, for another great <laughs> rye pun there. Um, and because of production issues, we just we didn't actually get it produced quite early enough to send out in January, ironically. So it became the uh, sort of February edition. Um, but I've wanted to do it for a long time, but we don't have the luxury really with our monthly boxes of doing anything too far off piste away from single malt scotch. Now we do encourage people to explore blends, to explore world whiskies, to explore single grains and, and things like that. 
we're definitely and, and heavily in favor of exploration. But as well as our sort of direct subscribers, we have a lot of gift subscribers at any one time. And most people come to us because they're single malt or, or single malt Scotch fans or Scotch fans. And so if we do anything, if we send someone who's a Scotch fan or a single malt fan, and they're used to drinking sort of Scotch names that you'd be familiar with, if we send them a whole box of rye, we're probably going to make them quite unhappy in some cases. So uh, um, our core sort of monthly box has to, to some extent, play to the base. We have to balance peat against not peat. We can put some world whiskey in and we even do whole boxes dedicated to it. But then there's things like primarily single malts and things that are made in the same style as scotch so that we're not going to alienate too many customers. Um, so this is really, and it's our first ever one-off edition, but it's a, an excuse for us to go off piece, explore another category, go a little bit more premium as well, because we're not constrained by the fixed price of the monthly box and the fixed budget that goes with it. Um, and to put together a box for something that's really compelling for us as whiskey fans, uh, which we then hope other whiskey fans will want to try. So that's the sort of the idea of the shiny edition. And as I said, in this case, Harry, who's been working with us almost since, I think since, March last year and came on full time back in September as our head of marketing and customer experience. So Harry actually chose the rise in this box. She's a big rye fan. Uh, I think her Instagram tag has even got the word rye, Harry, Harry. No, it might be Hi Rye Harry or something like oh, that. Yeah. Um, but uh, she, she is a rye fan and she chose these. I think the reason I mentioned that is because I think probably the Kiro was the one, and you, you're supposed to roll the R by the way, but I'm, I'm not a linguist. Um, <laughs> Kira was uh, one that she's probably the most excited about and one of the few she'd also tried before because she actually used to work with Dave back at Maverick Drinks, who um, are the distributor of Boutique, um, and had tried Kira then. Um, so it is a really interesting dram, and that to me stands out straight away when you smell it. Um, and it does say on the bottle, have I got it here? Uh, so... It's 100% rye. So as we've been talking about, uh, there's the 100%. Yeah, it's, which is weird, uh, right? It's weird. Uh, rye. Um, there's a funny backstory to the distillery. It's Finnish. Um, and I think they had the idea for it, as you might expect, of the Finns in the sauna. So there's quite a cool story on their website. They've got a virtual tour on their website as well about the idea behind uh, starting the distillery um, and how it came to be, but uh, they specifically, I think, wanted to work with rye from the from the beginning. Yeah, and why not? I think why not because it's this is um, like I just chucked up there. Like um, as Jake said, it's very different on the nose, and so it should be um, because it's it's one hundred percent rye, as we've said, but also it's going to be aged in uh, in the Finnish climate, which. It's um it's different year year on year, but like it's not the difference between day and night, like in Kentucky, which is can be quite hot in the day and quite cool at night. Um, so it is going to taste very different, I think. Uh, I'm, I was just looking at the barrels then as well. So it, it's aged in new oak barrels as well. So it's it's basically like an American rye. It's, it's, just, it's, and... it's just as as we've said, it's unusual that it would be mm. even close to a hundred percent. Uh, so part of the challenge they've had and part of the reason there's not been a lot of it around before is that they did a lot of small batches exactly because they couldn't make a big batch because it's so hard to work with the rye. And they use Finnish rye, it's, so it's um, grown in, grown uh, locally in Finland. Um, so as it says on the card, like uh, they did a lot of small batches and this is their first sort of core range uh, rye as such. Um, so get, coming back to the idea of the, the shiny thing, um, as I said, I've talked about how the cards are ever little you can see they're slightly shiny. You can see they're, they're in a light. Obviously, we've got the silver caps, the silver envelope. Um, but one of the main things is, we, as I said, it allows us to play with budget. So this box is more premium. Uh, typically, the sort of five, 25 mil drams in our box average around 50 pounds at retail. And the six dram being somewhere around 125-ish, uh, give or take. Um, in this case, the average is more like 75 or 80, I think. Um, so the first one we tried, the English... Uh, the London rye was, uh, I think, fifty pounds a bottle. The Kiro is fifty pounds a bottle, but it's a fifty cl, and both the boutiques are actually seventy five for fifty cl. 
So it's a little bit more premium than we'd normally be able to do within our monthly box. Uh, so that was a lot of fun as well because we didn't really have to normally we have to juggle all the back box the, the bottle prices and get to the average uh, so that we have the the right spend every month. Um, but in this case, we started with what whiskies do we want and then just worked out what the box needed to cost afterwards. So it's a little bit more of a fun way of doing it, to be honest, but you couldn't really do that with a subscription where you just charge people a random amount of money every month. Um, but it does give you a little bit more license to explore. What do you make of this one, Ben? Because mm. to me, it's got that really fresh hay, grass, yeah. floral nose, but then I get a lot of like dark chocolate and sort of malty biscuit when I taste it. There's, um, I would say, danger territory. I would say this is I've got a, a lot. I'm trying to put my words carefully, but it's got it's got a lot more kind of dynamic flavors to it than the other two we've had so far. I think even with the weird cask types of the first one, like you said, every time you stick your nose in, you're getting something different. Um, it, I'm very much enjoying it. Absolutely. Um, I don't think I would be reaching for this every day if I had a bottle, but it would be just something nice to have uh, put the back of the cabinet and forget you've got it and then go, Oh cool. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll drink a bit of that. But yeah. So it, what it reminds me of actually, and I don't know. I'm trying to think when I've had it. So in the, in Canada. So um, my other half Sarah is originally from Vancouver. We've been over there a few times in the last year and the distilling scene in, in Canada Oh, with the newer distillers are what I would call sort of brewing led distilling. So they take a more like just a brewery style approach to how they make their mash and then they distill it. Um, so you get more interesting, you get more diversity of malts than you would, uh, or barley and things like that than you might in, in scotch. So one of those is they have sort of chocolate influenced barley and i think it's just certain grains that have been toasted a certain way or a different strain of uh, barley and that sort of thing but to me that has a lot of this going on that that's what it presents as that sort of slightly toasted chocolatey um, flavor and there's a lot of that going on here as if it was chocolate malt weirdly i'm getting a kind of like a mentholy note on the back end which i know is, is common with some rice um it's a little bit um kind of minty i guess yeah yeah the herbal minty note mm. yeah a very interesting dram very interesting dram um i do i do like it but like i said i don't think it, i would reach for it over the others if i had them in a line up together um yeah i would just enjoy it as part of like a collection like this to kind of get the differences well, i think that was what really is fascinating for me about this the first time we tasted through this, Harry and myself, we had a sort of dram team Christmas party. Now, since it's just me and Harry um, and the chaps from Top Whiskers who run our social media, um, a, a, a sort of part of the team, but Harry and I are the only technical employees of the dram team. So our Christmas party was Harry and me, both of our partners, and then one of my old friends who sort of founded the, the business with me. And now my brother-in-law, we just tasted through them for our Christmas party because we couldn't have a real Christmas party. Um, and once I got past the sort of spicy peppery bit and my tongue had gone a bit numb, I, I think I just wasn't really well prepared. And I went in too eagerly on the, on the drinks. Um, what then really stood out as we went through them all was just how different they were. And I think I had been guilty and I'm definitely guilty of this in other areas as well. So for example, Irish whiskey or single grains or rye or bourbon, of just lumping them into this category. It was like, this is one big category and they all taste roughly the same and what really stands out when you go through them like this is that there's so much diversity within the category um perhaps not as diverse as the whole category of scotch but it certainly there was more variety within it than i would have expected i think mm, absolutely um i'm gonna have a bash answering this question but i'm not entirely sure of the technical reasons but for me i think when you obviously when you malt you're starting that um, sugar making process within the um within the within the, the the bits that you're using within whatever kind of grain you're using so when you use unmalted obviously that's going to be a, a vastly diminished process so malting makes yeah i mean you're actually going to get alcohol out of it so i guess that's the reason why um using unmalted so, it's often to the enzymes so part of the reason malted 
barley is used in single grain production, for example, is that the enzymes that are created or released, I'm not saying which, during the malting process, then help in the fermentation um, to, to get more sweetness, I believe. So I think it, I think malting it would make it more manageable. If, if anything else, it sort of it initiates a sort of breaking down of the really starchy original uh, grain. What I would recommend, because it's really good, is go to if you just go to Google and Google how is rye whiskey made, Dram Team, then you should somewhere on the first page see a link um, a link to our, our blog. Uh, and Harry wrote a really good article about how is rye whiskey made, and it just talks through some of the differences. So in, in some ways, rye whiskey um, is a little bit of a wild, wild west compared to scotch. So for those of you who don't know, scotch is really narrowly defined about how you make it. Uh, so single malt scotch has to be made in a, a pot still. It has to have 100% malted barley. And of course, the single part means it's all from one distillery. Um, you... With rye, especially across different geographies, you'll find that there's no, there's very little restriction on how you make it. The mash bill can be completely different in different places. How much rye is in there is not even, you know, the US it has to be 51% to be called a rye. In Canada, they call everything rye regardless of what it is, because in their history, that was just almost a synonym for whiskey. Uh, in Scotland, there's no such, you can't have a Scotch rye whiskey because the rules dictate it would have to be called a grain whiskey if it was made. So you might have tried Scottish rye, but it wouldn't be called uh, it wouldn't be called Scotch rye whiskey because you're just not allowed to do that. With it would have to be called Scotch uh, grain whiskey. Well, uh, single malt or or, or well, it couldn't be if it was all malted, I guess. But no, that has to be barley. So there, it has to be a grain um, of, of some type. Um, so it's it's really diverse in how it's produced because there's very much little little regulation compared to, to scotch so if those of you who are more into your scotches and haven't had a rye before you'll probably find that there's less consistency to the production methods uh, which does allow them for a bit of play in, in the style i suppose there you go there you go it's it's yeah. an interesting one i think people kind of set into their their um defined styles um, which is why i find stuff like this interesting because they don't have to pick rye they, they've just cho chosen tonight but probably because it's difficult they could do whatever they wanted to um and uh, again with uh with the next one that we're going to go on to in a moment um uh, another kind of nordic one and it's it's the same thing they don't have to use rye they're just doing it because it's interesting and uh, underutilized especially in europe well in some cases i guess it might also to be do with, I, I don't actually know what the major sort of um crops are hmm. uh, but is more rye grown in somewhere like Finland. I, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to speculate. <laughs> no idea what the agricultural habits are of Finnish farmers, but it might just be that that's more locally available or that they um, think it's under celebrated and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, I think it's, I've always enjoyed exploring different types and styles of whiskey. So for me, it's uh, mm. a lot of fun when there's something that's a bit less uh, narrowly regulated than 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 some of this uh, the stars of scotch are yeah right absolutely. how have you polished off that one vin no i'm actually saving a little bit um for uh later i'll run through them again i think um probably after the stream and see how i feel after i've finished these ones but i am ready for the next one if that was your big question um it was so we're Ooh. back on to another boutique rye company so for those of you who aren't familiar this normally or, or the majority of their bottling are released under the Boutique Whiskey Company. Uh, so obviously this is one of their, their rye series, hence the name difference. So this is now Stowning uh, Distillery. I'm, I'm gonna, is that going to be visible? Yeah, if my camera does its job. It's not doing very good zoom. Uh, so that's Boutique Rye Company, Stowning, another one that's three years old, uh, at batch one. And again, I'll hold up the original bottle. It's got a nice playful label. Uh, and I don't think you're able to make out that text. Oh, yeah, actually, you, maybe you can. But you can see there's a list there, um, my whiskey distillery checklist. And it says butcher first, and I can't read them in, in the screen, pilot, doctor, teacher, chef, four engineers, Belize rum cask, which is what this was uh, aged in, 
24 pot stills known as Spanish onions, old bacon smoke oven, pickling bat, meat mincer, abattoir. So actually part of the story of Stowning is that it is housed in a building that used to be an abattoir, hence the slightly uh, random list of things. And I think probably the list there of uh, butcher pilot, doctor, teacher, chef is something to do with the founders. But maybe Dave can uh, drop a few comments in and uh, illuminate us in that regard. Hundred percent malted rye, so for, that's quite good that we've completely by accident put this next to the to the Kiro. Uh, so we've got two one hundred percent malted ryes back to back here. So that's going to be quite an interesting comparison. Very much so, and they, and they are very different as well. I think it like the rum influence for me is maybe what's. So I think that would work quite well with rye because we talked a little bit about uh, how good ryes are in old fashions. So mm. it depends how you make your old fashioned, but one way you can do it is uh, stirring in either a, a sugar cube or some actual sugar and brown sugar works quite nicely in those. Dom's asking, um, uh, he's, he's drinking an Eagle Rare. Uh, it's a low rye content. Um, is there a huge difference in high rye content whiskey? Um, I mean, it depends what you mean by a huge difference, I think, because, I mean, obviously we're just talking about a percentage change. So um, for me, they tend to be a lot spicier when they've got the high rye uh, content, a lot, a lot more warming, a lot more of those cinnamon notes coming through. But um, it's difficult. If, in a blind tasting, it's really difficult to tell if you're drinking a high rye or a low rye whiskey, I find anyway. Some people might be into that, but um, I don't know. What do you think about that, Chris? Well, I'm, I'm going to speculate because I can't say I've compared, and I think this is an interesting comparison, what we're doing now. Mm. Um, but if you think about it, on the low end, certainly as Dom says, something with the US rye, it could be as little as 51%. I mean, it has to be 51%. Um, uh, and what Dave Worthington said earlier about the, the first boutique we had was that it was considered a high rye whiskey at 60 to 65%. So what that tells you is that if 60 to 65% is considered high, that probably most rye whiskies in the US are in the 50s. Um, and therefore, the other 50% is either going to be malted barley or corn, most likely. And that's going to really change the, I would imagine it really changes the character. You, you should, if you've got 100% rye versus 50%, 51% rye with either malted barley or corn or some combination, that should be quite noticeable. But I, I'm not saying I'd be able to pick it. I would just imagine that it was a little bit more that if you were carefully comparing styles with, with several of ones that around the 50% mark and several at the 100% mark, that you'd definitely pick out differences in those. Um, and I think you said that you'd, you'd expect the 100% one to be more, more rye <laughs> such like spice <laughs> and a bit more peppery and that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, those be dropping us a few little bit, bits of nuggets about this um, stowning. Um, this is the nine founders come from diverse backgrounds <laughs> originally an abattoir which is interesting um oh, really? yeah. why not mm. uh, and they said they've been very inventive with their processes and have many automated operations which i quite like i like that um i, I recently you say recently it was a couple of years ago now i went to the waterford distillery and that's that whole place can be run by like two people on a shift which is crazy um they can just all do it from a control room but I, I really like that sort of thing um i know a lot of people like the kind of uh the stories and the wistfulness of, of the old distilleries where it takes someone who's worked there for 50 years to run everything but um yeah I, i'm a big fan of that automation i like that i, I think i remember seeing a lot of that at, at glenn murray and space i had just basically a really complicated computer screen which was almost like a diagrammatic mm. version of distillery and it showed which bits were open and closed and what was working, what wasn't. Um, I, I'm happy either way. Uh, I think, again, diversity is something I really enjoy in whiskies. So diversity of production techniques tends to lend itself to diversity of, of style as well. Um, uh, how are you getting on with this one, Vin? I find this one interesting that I hold it in the mouth and I'm really enjoying how mellow it is. And then I swallow it and as it goes past and over the back of my mouth, it hits me with a peppiness, which is interesting. Yeah. I mean, for me, the um, the nose is is astounding. It's but my favourite nose of the uh, of the tasting so far. Really like that. Um, definitely picking up those, those sweet kind of rum like notes from that. Mm. Yeah, well, actually, I think I lost track of that thread I was saying. 
with Ribingen old fashions that often, you know, you would often use brown sugar in an old fashioned. Um, obviously, one of the predominant tasting notes of rum is uh, sugar or brown sugar, um, sort of Demerara style, that sort of thing. So it's possible, I could see how just intuitively that would complement um, the rye whiskey quite well. Mm. So what Dave's saying here, but we're talking about production techniques. So they've got quite an inventive, innovative style by the looks of it in terms of how they think about production. So they're saying they've automated quite a lot of it. As you said, they've got their own malting equipment that turns the grain for them. No monkey shoulder. So um, I can talk about this because this is something that I know about from Scotch. So malting is when you malt a grain, you literally make it damp or wet and then you lay it out on a big floor in a malting uh it well it's called a floor malting um but it's basically a big building big barn with a lot of floor space and you lay it out somewhere around eight inches deep often um and you let it malt which is letting it almost let sprout um and then you dry it out at some point to stop it um completely well, basically growing uh, so what they would do to ensure that the malting process was consistent with, is this used to be done by hand that have a sort of big sort of like a, a adapted broom or something where they'd just be turning over the malted uh, barley the malting barley i suppose um and people would get what was called monkey shoulder because people would use their one dominant hand to do it and just doing this all day, every day, just turning malt over in a big warehouse, uh, they would get monkey shoulder. One one shoulder was sort of dropped or high versus the other. I'm not quite sure which way around it was. Um, so it sounds like it's a good idea that's downing. It's not often done by that way anymore. There's very few places where it's still turned by hand. Um, I think possibly Springbank in Campbelltown, maybe Bamore on, on Isla. Uh, there's very few distilleries where they sort of, uh, turn malt by hand. In fact, very few distilleries even have their own floor maltings. Uh, it's quite unusual. So um, they've automated that by the sounds of it. But in the next comment there, Dave said they still use direct fired copper pot stills, um, i.e. the heat is applied directly to the outside of the still. That's not that's reasonably unusual. Um, it, that's been modernised in quite a lot of cases uh, with scotch. So mm. a little bit of an interesting blend there of modern and traditional techniques in their production yeah yes yeah, it's, it's an interesting one on the um on the palette it's very different as well um i'm not sure what makes it different that's the thing that's getting me um i think it's a bit more a bit more tannic a bit more kind of like more oaky a bit more leathery than than the other ones hmm. i'm finding that i'm needing a bit more water this one to get at the, the i might join you on that actually is this it's a very interesting one. Um, I'm trying to decide if it's my favourite one or not so far. I think it might be. So we've got a little bit more knowledge being dropped in. So Mike's corrected me with the, the actual name, a malt shovel, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's used to turn the uh, the malting barley over. Um, not an adapted broom, as I said. <laughs> Even as I said that, I knew I was talking about I just couldn't find the word for shovel in my brain. Uh, and Dave's also recommend something I would recommend actually. Um, so Batiki do a series of podcasts. Um, they're well worth looking up. Uh, so if you want to hear someone much more knowledgeable than me talking about right whiskey, go and check out the Uncore podcasts, um, and then come back and and write to me and tell us what you learned. I, I can't learn this one either. So I definitely preferred of the two Batikis. I definitely preferred the first one, the Peerless. Mm. Who are just being a sort of out and out classic rye to me. I think I preferred this one, you know. I'm just going to go back and try the other one without. I think it end. might be a little bit more complex, but I can't. Perhaps it's not sweet enough for me. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, they they're very different. Um. Yeah, a hard choice for me. That would definitely depend on my mood of the day. I think. Um. And today, I'm leaning more towards the Stowning. But tomorrow, I might well think the Peerless was better. That's that's the weird thing about whiskey, isn't it? Right? So, yeah. a, a lot of it's dependent on your mood, on who you're with, what situation you're in. Yeah, I, I I really like that one actually. That surprised me. Surprised me. Oh, yeah. Now, it's definitely made me want to get more rye on my whiskey shelf. 
But as I say, I'm going to finish off that Sonoma one fairly soon at the rate I'm getting through it. It's too much, too much of a thirst for old fas fashions that I've developed. Talking of Sonoma, should we move on? Uh, are you ready to move on? Yeah, why not? Um, I think it's been really slow just now because it's half nine. I think normally we've started at eight in the past, but actually we're bang on time at 15 minutes of dram, pretty much. We are, we are indeed. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm steadily keeping an eye on it today, which is good. Um, I think actually, do you know what? I've just realised that I've put that down as uh, question mark, question mark, because um, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. Uh, let me just change that while we're live. Ha! <laughs> Why not? There you go. Um, this one's an interesting one because it's got some some smokiness to it. Some uh, ten percent cherry wood smoked barley. So that's going to be a, a, an interesting one for me because I'm really getting into my peated whiskey. I've been a, been a huge fan of peat for a couple of years now. Um, so and I've never tried a rye like this before. So I, I love this one. So like I am, um, I can't remember when it was, but I think it was been three or four years ago. So I'm a member of a, a whiskey club here in Bristol, um, affectionately called Boas Bristol Whiskey Bristol Whiskey Appreciation Society, um, and going back. It must have been January 2017, I think. So maybe four years. Um, we did uh, we did ride January, and the Sonoma. I think the previous um, whiskey exchange festival in London, we'd met the people from Sonoma uh, at the whiskey festival in London, and chatted to them and tried them and really liked them. So we ended up picking up a bottle of Sonoma Cherrywood Rye as our bottle of the month when we all met up back when meeting up was something that people did um <laughs> and we split the bottle and tried it that evening and because i hosted that night we have a, a tradition where the host then keeps the rest of the bottle so i was fortunate to have sort of a third of a bottle of this on my shelf for a little while it didn't last very long um <laughs> and i still have fond memories of it ever since so i'm a big fan of sonoma uh, sonoma better known for wine as a county by the way um in california so mm. relatively unusual not known as a sort of whiskey producing region within the US. Um, yeah. But I really, uh, really like this. I, I, think, I, uh, is, I don't think I would have known it had anything smoky in it. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, especially on the nose for me, it's, I kind of agree with what it's saying down here. You know, there's some kind of leathery notes and for me, it's kind of a, a bit marzipan-y, not a lot, but just a touch which I guess is, I mean, they're saying almonds and cherries, which is, is the thing, isn't it? So, but yeah, there's a kind of, um, maybe not smokiness to it, but. I think you said the right word for me there was leather, like on the palate, yeah. towards the end and it lingers. Like a, uh, I'm going to go, I'm gonna, I had enough dramas to get invented now. Sort of like, if you inherited your grandfather's chair that he used to smoke his pipe in. And open his um, desk drawer. Oh, Sonoma, another whiskey discovery. Mm. Oh, and Fires Night, introducing Dave to new whiskeys. <laughs> I have to say, as well, I mean, before, um, before Dave moved over to Boutique, uh, which is a, an amazing move, I was a massive fan of um, of, uh, of their blog uh, blog site. And uh, it was a real shame to see it um, it kind of disappear. I know I know his daughter tried to keep it going for a while, um, but I think even she's got a job in the industry now as well, so... That's the problem um, with all these whiskey bloggers. They get too knowledgeable about whiskey and they end up getting employed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, going off things a little bit, there was a couple of channels back in the day when I started who, um, who've got themselves jobs in the industry now as well. And they've had to kind of give up their, their, their passion on the, uh, on the blogging side of it, uh, the vlogging side, but you know, they're doing cool things in the industry. I, I'm just not sure I could, not that I've had any uh, offers of jobs or anything, but I'm not sure I could give it up now. It's, um, I'm too far in. <laughs> well, I suspect as, as much as anything, it's probably a time constraint. I don't think, um, mm. yeah, I mean, a lot of, especially going back to when I started the business, the, the interesting whiskey blogging was really different back in 2015, 2016. Mm. There were a lot less. Uh, and most of the really predominant, uh, prominent ones were people like Dave, who'd actually been doing it for, for, for a while, relatively mm. at that time, um, because blogging itself was really still quite young, uh, but especially in niches as, as, as narrow as whisker is now, there's there's a lot, lot more, um, which is great. Um, 
yeah, it was certainly Dave was uh, Dave and Whiskey Discovery a big uh, notice uh, the short list of sort of ten whiskey blogs um, back in 2015, 2016. Um, but I do think it, it's a lot of work that goes into it. Certainly, you must put a lot of work into your your whiskey channel, then. Um, and I think perhaps I, I don't know if it's working, uh, which takes more work, video or, or writing. It could be either way. Um, I think I think it really depends on um, where your passions lie, for sure. Um, it's uh, for me. Um, I I really can't be bothered to write anything down or or spend time making sure my words are great. Um, I'm, uh, that's not where where. Yeah. So I mean, and the funny thing was when I started my channel, I wasn't that into um, into video production either. You know, I just decided to proper camera up. Um, never thought anybody would would watch it. So um, I kind of learned that passion as I went on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I decided to do video because it didn't seem like anyone was doing it at the time. Um, there was a couple, obviously, but uh, and blogs were around for sure, um, a couple of high profile ones. But and it's a lot of effort, I think, to get your blog underneath someone's nose where YouTube does a lot of that for you. So it's uh, yeah, it depends on your on your on your personal preference. A lot of people don't like being in front of the camera. Um, which is really the deciding factor, I think, whether you weren't going to do that or, or the other. It's, it's a lot easier to start a blog, I would say, but a lot easier to gain momentum on video. If that answers that <laughs> succinctly, I think that's why I would do that. That makes sense. Um, mm. well, I think it's really good just to see that. I think if, if you look at how the whiskey community has grown online since uh, mm. when you started your channel, right, exactly the same month we launched our first box or just after, uh, for those that don't know, Vin is now the only full-time, I was going to say full-time dram team, like he's had every box since. Every, uh, every single one, yeah. 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 Um, so he's the only uh, man still standing from August 2016. <laughs> so um, uh, there's some others very long-term, certainly not far behind. But um, yeah, because you started your channel that same month precisely i believe uh so if you yeah. look at that five years and how much the whiskey community online's grown and and this year obviously proliferated to a new extent um which has been good and hopefully will sustain so that's really nice yeah definitely i mean uh, we were talking about this just a little bit off air and it's um january would usually be a good um down month for uh whiskey but it it, it really hasn't been for me and you said yourself it's been not maybe yet as busy as other months, but definitely busy for a January, I think is fair to say. Yeah, January in previous years has been almost dead quiet um, in terms of demand for what we do, like our, our own product on that we sell directly, obviously. And then we also make sets for the for the whiskey companies uh, that are similar to our own, but with their whiskies in. Uh, that's been also still quite busy just because um, people like the Scotch Whiskey Whiskey Society and, and so on are using online as a platform more and more. So i think that's good because i think it brings people it allows people to get involved from other geographies people that couldn't get to in-person events for some reason uh, to take part which is good i've really enjoyed that it's every good as every bit as good as i remember it being yeah. how are you get i mean it's this is really good it's um like you said earlier i mean the smoke it's not really smoky it's yeah, I mean, it's so leathery, it's unreal. Oh, yeah. I mean, I... A waft of smoke. So I really like, I'm not massive on peat, but I like peat where it's really balanced and sort of like a backdrop to, to the main uh, taste in the whiskey. So like Ben Romac 10 for me, where it's almost like that, like you were in a forest somewhere and far away there was someone having a campfire. Uh, not like it was a really peated dram where right in front of your nose someone was having a campfire. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that far off distance, like waft on the breeze of, of campfire. And I think that's almost similar here that it's very, very subtle, but you know it's there. But again, yeah. it's very difficult to know is again, if you gave me this blind and asked me which one of them peated had any peat, could I tell you? No, I definitely couldn't. <laughs> so you know, I might just be being led by the down the garden path by what I know about the whiskey there. Definitely. Uh, I agree. Um, I think if, if this was on a blind tasting, I wouldn't have a clue what this was at all. It was it's it's got so much um in it and going for it. 
Mm. Our blind tastings are humiliating for even the geekiest of whiskey <laughs> drinkers. All they all they reveal is how little you really know about whiskey, and that you're just really good at um, the um, being accepted by tasting notes and knowledge that you have about a drink. <laughs> we do um, blind tastings quite a lot um, on on YouTube and whatnot. And whenever I'm involved in one, something that I seem to do every single time without fail. I mean, apart from get them all wrong, is um, I always pick the uh, the relatively expensive one is my favorite and then the cheapest one is my second favorite um which is always good for me because i never bother buying the best one i always buy the the the, the more value one and it, you know the second the second one my favorite of the of the evening is always the cheapest one for some reason so i'm like that's fine with me i'll, I'll live with that your man with sensible tastes i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah um we've got a couple of questions here uh, so uh Vilas is asking that he's noticed all the drams are within 3% ABV. So I actually noticed that when I was um, checking over the details of the tasting cards and prepping the labels. Um, little fact on a dram team, we print all our labels. In, in, well, I have two label printers sat to my left. <laughs> and we print them all in-house. Um, so I have to quite carefully check uh, the ABVs and things before I go to print. Um, and I did notice that several of them were the same ABV. And normally, I thought I'd just copy paste. I thought I'd probably just copy paste from the previous one and not changed it. But actually, two of them were definitely the same, and they are all quite similar. I don't know why that is. It's not. It, there's no reason. Um, no rhyme, or you should have got rhyme or reason there. The last, sorry. <laughs> um, there's no rhyme or reason to that. Um, it's just coincidence. Uh, perhaps it's something to do with um, a range in which rye taste good maybe they were you know mm. when the master blenders the distillers and the different distillers are making decisions about the uh, the bottling strength they just happen to uh, come to the same sort of conclusion I, I would think with the whistle pig which we'll move on to shortly that it might just be close to what it came out the cask i mean it's probably still a bit low actually it would have been nation of a, a cold climate but um so i think the answer there is probably coincidence for us um and then from Dave, we've got some uh, commentary. He's now catching up and trying some of the other the drams. Um, really, yeah, the, the bread note. So another fact about Dave, really keen amateur baker. I say amateur, it looks very professional from what mm. I've seen. Um, Dave's uh, posts about bread, his bread-making endeavours make me extremely hungry when I see them. So he probably knows a thing or two about rye. Um, and then, uh, Vin, can you pop up the one about the uh, East London liquor? Because I think that really speaks to the sort of diversity of it um, that we talked about before. Like you've got sweet and fruity, you've got fruit salad, you've got rhubarb custard, the sort of creaminess, um, vanilla, and then sherbet as well, which is, you know, more citrus and fizzy, as it were. The, yeah, thank you, Dave. Really good tasting notes on those. Um, gosh, Tim, I'm sorry, I keep getting distracted by how many awful rye puns there are in the comments as well. <laughs> Nice. yeah like what dave said here see um it's something i always do as well maybe dave taught me that because I, I went to a, a tasting uh a boutique tasting with dave i think quite early on when uh, i just started doing what i was doing and uh dave had only just started what he was doing um and it's, it's just a habit i picked up always always is go back to um some of the previous ones after you've tried something that's quite strong because it almost cancels out some of the continual flavors. Like yeah. trying this one here must cancel out some of the those kind of those rye elements. So you can go back and try something else. And I'm really getting that sherbet now that Dave's implanted that in my head. Uh, well, I agree, but I've stuck to half measures tonight. Um, mm. and I've been too enthusiastic and drunk them all while I've gone along. Um, right, are you ready for the... Um, the big one vibrations is that is that a libration a libations joke like vibrations <laughs> vibration explain it. it's not funny right greg if you have to explain the pun <laughs> <laughs> first to see greg drop again so greg another one of the original founders of the dram team uh greg mm. myself and uh, my friend and brother-in-law james glenn so um greg also a big ryan pun fan by the looks of it <laughs> Uh, I'm enjoying throwing them up on the screen. Um, it's a uh, it's a good way. It's, it's a good thing. I like these. I like these puns. I like these puns. Uh, Tim saying that the uh, the Kiro is on his hit list so far. Uh, yeah, the marzipan definitely. I agree. Definitely, I agree. 
I'm glad that one's going down well. Well done, Harry. That was I said that was one of Harry's like uh, one that she was quite excited to put in the box. So interesting that it's gone down well. I, I think it's interesting to me, Mark, primarily because it stands out as being so different. Um, I think I had the same experience as it was some of those chocolate malt uh, whiskies in in Canada. I tried that the chocolate malt in it, just really unusual flavour note in there. But when you combine that with that sort of fresh hay and things like that, it's really nice. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I've already started nosing the. Uh, me the too. <laughs> so okay. I'll go back a bit because um, oddly, like we have a lot of difficulty sometimes choosing six drams because. As I said earlier, when we when we put the boxes together, we're constrained by the budget with plus or minus that we vary a bit month to according to where we're buying from and, and what we want to put in and that sort of thing. But we do have to sort of balance the budget each month because we have a fixed amount of money to spend every time. So the, it's easy across the first five because they you can average between the five to get to the sort of 50 retail price. On the six drag, because there's only one of them, you have to be a little bit more narrow in defining uh, the price range for it um and also because we want to set an expectation that it's always something special not that something has to cost a lot to be special but i think if you put in something that's 80 quid as a six dram it sort of loses the that dream dram sort of angle that we put it in there for uh, and for those again for those of you who don't know typically and not true in this case at all this is a 10 mil dram which is the same sort of size pour you get at a festival often uh, considered not enough and <laughs> generally I'd agree with that but the idea was that rather than just having a sixth dram that's the same size we'll put something in super special um, and we'll make it a festival size dream dram pour so the 10 mil uh, we might actually be forced to retire the six dram soon because we can't any longer buy these size bottles <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure that out we've got 5,000 boxes in our warehouse with a hole that fits this bottle uh, and we've only got about 5,000 of these bottles left so we might have to retire the six dram soon so for those of you that are dram teamers we'll probably be surveying you about what you'd prefer we do uh, to solve that because we'll either go down to five drams and make the fifth one really expensive uh, so you get a full-size portion of it or we'll go up to six but because of the cost of doing that we'd have to then increase the price slightly on the box but um, it is normally £125 or thereabouts a bottle for what we put into the six dram. Now, in this case, because it's a one-off and we were able to price it differently to the monthly box, we are able to be a bit more uh, flexible in what we put in there. Um, but what I was saying is we, we find it hard to pick six drams sometimes because once you narrow down a category, there's not that many in the 125 price range. Like if you look at single malt scotch, there's a lot. Um, Typically, most 21 year old whiskies are in that price bracket. Um, and then some 18 year olds, if you're McAllen or someone else who has slightly uh, out of alignment pricing versus the distilleries. But when you narrow down to a certain category, it can be really difficult to find whiskies in that price range. So, like even just going to world whiskey, you won't find so many that are in that category. And then when you go down to like bourbons or rye or anything like that, you'll only have two or three to choose from in that price bracket. Um, now, of course, we weren't as constrained, but there's not that many expensive rye whiskies out there. Um, and also, we always have to permission the person that we're working, uh, the brand, to, to re-bottle their stuff into a sample. Uh, we don't just do that willy-nilly. So um, in this case, we decided to extend the budget. So this whistle pig... 15 year old so 15 year old is extremely unusual for for rye whiskey i think the next oldest whistle pig is 10 years old and that is about 120 240 a bottle i think this is over 200 a bottle and more like 220 so it really is a really special whiskey because even though you've only got 10 mil that's still sort of three quids worth uh, a measure at, just at cost of, of whiskey that you've got there um so it's um really it's quite a nice little treat for us to be able to include something like this um so i remember the i remember the video call harry and had where we we're trying to decide what to put in a six and we we're looking at the options we're like oh we should we should go for the whistle pick <laughs> let's go for the whistle pick so we push the boat out um have you had a chance there to sip it then definitely yeah uh, i'm actually trying really hard not to finish it that's it's often the problem with the smaller drums is that they're very easy to gone um yeah, i'm quite looking forward to making it full size when we do it um so that people can get a full a full taste of it. 
But yeah, I mean, I, I always say it's enough to directionally know whether or not you like it. So at festivals, when you go in and get a festival pour of 10 mil, whether it's a dream dram or just one of the other drams, like from that two sips, really, you can yeah. tell do I like this or not and probably how much, but you can't explore it because you've already finished it. <laughs> so I think that at least gives you a directional guidance as to whether it's something you'd like to get to grips with better. Definitely. I mean, um, for me, this is like, this is i mean definitely my favorite of, of the of the flight um but i think that was pretty obvious uh, i mean I, I always save the sixth gram for the drum chain glass of course um <laughs> but as to, um, i mean i think uh i think dom's gone now but he asked earlier about um the age difference uh if it makes a difference and this for me is is, is really defining that because it's it's way more subtle in terms of its wryness at least and that's only good for me. I like that a lot. And so I think the thing is for me that's interesting is even after 15 years in the cast, that pepperiness and that spice mm. is still there though. Like it still hits you a little bit. Even if, and it's a, it's 46% ABV, which of all the lineups tonight, is it the lowest? Yeah, so it's the lowest ABV of the lot, but it still hits you that peppery spice note. Yeah, a lot of people saying. Uh, lost time with his ripens in the comments there thanks greg <laughs> dave's got a really good recommendation there as well so he said the finest rye whiskey is made in the netherlands so his first rye whiskey was from millstone so millstone is um, a dutch distillery big fan of them. i think they use sherry quite a lot they, they do quite a lot of single malt as well i believe but um their rye is uh i was gonna say renowned renowned the world <laughs> around um so definitely worth trying those out. But as Dave said as well, it's unusual. <laughs> Sorry, I keep having to break off to chuckle at things that people are saying. Some voice guy there saying they're going to do a, a, a Rye January Rye Visited podcast. It's, oh gosh, there's too many in there. <laughs> there's too many in there. But uh, do check out Whisk Eye on YouTube. If you, have, if you are a Dram Team subscriber and you have a spare and a half, then I would recommend listening. Uh, I'm going to, I met um, the two chats behind um, Whisk Eye at the Bristol Whiskey Festival that I helped run. And I think we were all a few jams worse for wear at the time. So it's, it's, it's Josh and I want to say David, um, I think a, a Yorkshireman and a Scotsman who uh, kind of drink the box between them and talk about it. But it's a really nice, just general way to spend an hour and a half. So if you have the box and listen, you, you know you want and Minvin don't do this every month. <laughs> um, they're much more consistent in their posting than, than we are. Um, so give that a look. Uh, and although obviously for the ride January I visited, you probably polished off your drams if you're watching this video already. So we've got a question here from Dave about this. Has it been in Virgin for all 15 years or has it been rewrapped? Um, so, and Harry has kind of answered, rewrapped, it was finished in Vermont Oak. So th I think a cool wrinkle on this dram, um, and we hinted a little bit about kind of provenance and using local ingredients of the, the finished rye and things like that. But um, in this case, Whistlepig have a, a big farm estate where the distillery is, um, and this, vermont oak finish is actually oak from the estate itself um so it's their own local estate oak that was used to finish this yeah there we go i uh, said so i think and so you alluded earlier to whistle pig about being them sort of canadian slash american so i think the way that they started so they are in vermont um i was about to say really confident which is in the u.s so it, it is in the u.s um but the way they got it started was they bought a massive parcel of rye whiskey, um, a, a parcel not being like a, you know, that's what you get from Amazon, just a large amount of rye whiskey from Canada that they then moved into Vermont. And uh, and that was, I think, certain. I don't know whether this would be from that or if this would be, um, they do now do, I believe, their own, um, make they, they make their own whiskey as well. But originally they started out, by buying a lot of Canadian rye whiskey. Mm. So do you get the thing that I was talking about right at the start when we were talking about age and rye? Yeah. Would you say this tastes like an old whiskey? Oh, see, I mean, 
after today's lineup, I would say this tastes like an old rye. But again, picking this out of a, of a, a blind lineup, I would not say that this is um, giving off particularly old whiskey notes as I know them. Um, I tend to get a lot of like old books and things like that off uh, an old whiskey. But yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's got a weird combination of like mellowness, which is what I am associating with the age. And then, as I said, it still has that rye spicy kick in the middle somewhere. But I do think that the nose, it's got some, someone said herbal, uh, Villa says saying maritime and coastal. Um, but for me, the age doesn't come through so much on the nose, but on the palate. Hmm. I think, I think the key thing to remember is that like, as we've talked about a lot, it's, um, it's old for a rye. Uh, rare for a rye but really 15 years in a cask is is quite normal um for us uh, over here so right. it's yeah so I, i'm i'm not sure i mean in in the context of today i'm, I'm definitely sensing what happens to a, a rye over over the years but again in a, in a blind lineup i'm not confident about my ability to pick that out as an older whiskey at all Hmm. No, it depends what else you were having against. I wonder against against what we had today that is almost do, too diverse for you to know that that was age and not some other factor at play. Um, I, I think probably it's just something that you're going to have to. Uh, you you probably just need to experiment. Like in your case, you'll have tried much more scotch than you will have rye. Uh, and I said you very unlikely have tried a rye this old. I thought I had. Because I had a bottle of twenty or twenty-one year old rye from Canada, it turned out it was a hundred percent corn. <laughs> it was just corn rye whiskey because it was Canadian. So I was talking all this nonsense about how I could really enjoy how the rye had mellowed out over time, and it turned out to be basically a bourbon matured in a really cold climate. <laughs> that was all it really was. Um, so that was my first experience with well-aged rye. Uh, it was very tasty, mind. It just wasn't made with rye. Uh, so no, I, I enjoyed that whistle pick. Um, mm. It's really hard for me to pick a favourite out of that six. I think yeah, I'm uh, just trying. <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to now. And um... I would say that for me, the most the most rye like of the rise was the peerless. So for me, that was the most classic. I really enjoyed it. Everything I want from a rye whiskey. Um, most matches what i would expect from a rye um and in a good way then i really love the sonoma i really do enjoy that um the but the kiro is just so interesting it's so different and interesting and as we just said the, the whistle pig is just a different level in terms of that age really has had an effect on for me mellowing it out and rounding it out a little bit so i find it really difficult to pick pick between that lot I said I wouldn't buy the whistle pick because I just don't buy whiskey that costs over two hundred quid. I don't buy whiskey that costs over a hundred quid uh, very often at all. Um, so for me, like bang for your buck, I'd probably go probably go Sonoma at fifty quid for seventy. Um, but I'd definitely be tempted to get pick up a bottle of the the Boutique Peerless as well. Um, and Do you know then, what? I, I mirror that a bit as well um, as a, a kind of like a yeah again i'm not sure i think i completely agree the the peerless is definitely the the, the uh, classic rye here um and i think it might be my favorite as well um gun to head i think it might be my favorite um with the sonoma not far behind and then the stowning i think um but again i mean they're all so close they're all so close so even if i said which one was the least favorite it would be like still leagues ahead of a lot of other whiskies that i've tried for sure it's a really strong lineup, so hat tip to Harry for picking such a strong lineup in the first place. Um, but maybe this is what you get when we take off the budgetary restraints of a normal drafting box and we don't have to put in a whiskey that's in the 25 to 30 quid price range. Everything's just excellent. But then that is the idea, right? The whole point of the shiny edition is we could put in exactly what we want and then we just make the box cost what it needs to to make that work. Um, so... Uh, I think that's I, that's been a real success for me. One, a category that I really love. Two, Harry picked the drums instead of me, so it was less work for me as well. Uh, it could be quite 
difficult decision making process and i'm sure harry would agree um and then uh to just as an experiment to, to have gone through that and seen it for our first ever sort of one-off I've, I've really enjoyed that so i think we'll definitely do one of these again in future just a matter of what we put into the next one um i'd definitely be really keen to do a bourbon one um mm. equally there's so many directions what was it you were saying before you'd like to do a peat one Pete, yeah, because um, I think, um, I mean, I, I know what you were saying before, but you have to kind of uh, go quite general on your tasting sets. Um, for me, I would love a, a peated one that I know that you can't do on your uh, on your monthly box because it will just, it, it will anger people um, who are not into peat. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I mean, I'd, and I'd love to try some peat that's like really weird as well, like... Um, sourced from all around the place that you wouldn't expect or weird cast types and stuff like that. Not just your generic, like I would like to see I'm going out a bit of a limit. I'd like to see a peated box that have no Isla whiskies in it to really oh, challenge yeah, you. Sure. Have you, have you tried much Le Chegg or Le Daig? Yeah. Call it yeah. I've got a couple of bottles down some here. Bonkers. Some of that is really bonkers. Yeah. I'm sure we could do something like that. So if anyone in the comments has any thoughts, obviously thoughts on the rye, very welcome. Uh, Tim there said he's, really enjoyed the session he's gonna to have to check into rehab i like that one <laughs> um so yeah if anyone has thoughts about what um they'd like to see in another shiny edition i don't i can't guarantee how quickly we'd get around to doing one um but it's because we do so much production now in terms of doing miniatures it's not too difficult for us to do an extra little special edition of just a, a limited run of sort of 50 to 100 boxes or something like that um and be a bit more uh, adventurous in what we put in it so if there's any special requests we're, we're always interested in ideas but i do like the idea of sort of a bonkers pete one or, or non-isla pete um mm. and then we can have a session packing peat and smoke puns into a, the chat for two hours <laughs> instead of rye puns. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, people have been dropping it in the comments what their favourites were of the night, but if, uh, if you haven't commented, then please do let us know. Um, I think the Peerless seems to be coming out on top with the Sonoma second. I think people would pick the Whistle Pig if it was cheaper, but uh, like, I think everyone here agrees that it's it, it too is much. Dish. Yeah, I mean... I mean, it comes in a nice fancy bottle, big heavy metal stopper. So that sells it for you. But that's one to sort of treasure if you do pick it up. I, I don't, I've don't. i never spent anywhere near that on a bottle of whiskey myself. So it, it's a bit too much. But the, the good thing about Whistlepig is um, they have uh, – they have uh, you know, if you really enjoyed that one, try some of their less expensive uh, bottlings. I'd say the 10 year is half the price typically – um, and they have other stuff that's more um, affordable as well, like non-age statements and so on. So do if you enjoyed the whistle pig, try some more of their, their stuff, I would say. Definitely. Um, they also do a, uh, a maple syrup, which is really hard to get. Um, I highly recommend it if you get a chance to. Like, it was one of the few times that I've been to a, a festival and been to a stand and tried a shot of something that wasn't whiskey or some other distilled spirit. Uh, and they were like, here, do you want a shot of uh, maple syrup? And I think, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> On pancakes with bacon, please. Oh, so it's... a couple of comments there. So Glenn's into the idea of bourbon. Um, oh, my video has just gone. It has. Sorry, everyone. I've just got a notification on my screen saying it looks like your camera is unplugged. I haven't touched the camera. Bear with me. I'll just see if I yeah. can. We can still hear you, though, so keep, keep talking. That's fine. So... Um, I was saying I like the idea of bourbon for sure. I'm definitely for that. Um, and hang on, here we go. Will this bring me back? It's it's unusual to have technical issues this far into a stream as well. Usually they're at the start. It is. It looks like you might have lost me properly. I don't know what's <laughs> happened there. Funnily enough, Harry and I have been having uh, technical difficulties on some of our comments calls the last few days. So I don't know this is... Uh, a software problem or something. I'll finish this one on audio. It's nearly time we wrapped up anyway. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're almost uh, dead on as well. This, um, this guy was saying that we ought to do a, uh, a Yorkshire distillery. So actually, for the next couple of months, we're, we're probably going to do... Uh, we've got a really cool special edition coming up next month. So we've done a big charity edition. Um, International Women's Day is on the 8th of uh, March. Um, and we're doing a big... 
special edition uh, featuring um, drams associated with women in whiskey. So on the 10th of March, we're going to have a tasting, which Vin, you'll be helping us with in the background. Harry will be hosting a really cool panel event with some prominent women from the world of whiskey. Uh, we've got some really great people involved, um, sort of master blenders, uh, business owners, distillers, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's really, really exciting. Um, so that's what March's box is going to be. And it's a good mix of sort of Scotch and world whiskies. And then we have, um, oh, it looks like my camera is back, it says. I, I don't see you yet, but, uh, oh, it's a different oh. camera camera i am oh, back <laughs> briefly got the laptop view um i'm back uh so yeah march is getting really exciting i think mainly because we're doing this panel event um with some really prominent women from the whiskey industry which is really exciting so um then we're going a little bit away from scotch in the next two months after that and we're doing the world whiskies for april and for May, and this is the point that I was getting to with, in relation to Yorkshire spirit, the, the distillery up there, we're going to do English whiskies. Mm. Um, haven't sourced any of the whiskey yet for those two months. But we've got a few in mind, but uh, we are planning to get Yorkshire spirit into that box. Um, I'm a big fan. I've holidayed in Scarborough quite a lot when I was younger. So, uh, and I still have an uncle who lives there. So um, I'm excited. Uh, to get an English whiskey's box together. Because, you know, two years ago, you probably couldn't really have done that. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly three, four years ago, you definitely could have, could not have. So, uh, yeah, we've got some exciting things coming up. But we'll have to start thinking about the next shiny edition before long as well, by the sounds of it. Yeah, definitely. I think there's um, a been good appetite for it. Uh, hopefully, it will gain traction as well, which is good. Um, I like the idea of, uh, of not being limited by the monthly cost. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, if you've enjoyed it, do you know if, if, if do comment now. But I think we're going to stop. So if you've got any thoughts after that, write to us and let us know. We're always interested. Literally, it'll be me or Harry who answers because there's no one else to do it. So if you write to Woodhouse, a uh, whiskey butler, fictional whiskey butler, that'll be uh, Harry most likely that will answer that or myself. Um, and uh, let us know what you reckoned. Um, but thank you for those of you who got a set and joined us. I've really enjoyed that. So Vin, are you going to be trying more rye in future now have we have we taken steps towards converting you absolutely yeah i mean um, one of the biggest things of, of doing this channel is forcing myself to be uh, a bit more diverse uh, and trying things from all over the world um i mean really uh, like <laughs> i always say to people i mean I'll, I'll cover anything like um good or good or bad or if i don't like it or do like it i'll i'll cover anything so um all, all it takes is for me to get a bottle of, of some rye and they're just um at the moment they haven't tended to catch my eye as much or maybe i just don't see them as much uh and, and to be honest i haven't had to needed to buy bottles recently because of christmas got a lot of bottles of christmas so um yeah i don't know uh maybe i'll start looking out for some more um especially um, i'm definitely interested in looking at london uh the east london liquor company um because that's new to me if well i said earlier they're all new to me uh mm. i think i'm not sure if the peerless is still available but maybe i'll have a look at a uh, a bottle of that because that's it was that... i think um, i had that on the screen so i think they are all available um mm. the two boutique ones are definitely on master of more at least by the looks of it so um yeah I, I think most of them are still available i think the most limited of them is probably the well actually no, the, the boutique is probably are the most limited because i think they're only sort of 400 or 500 or so bottles of each um but you can still get them all by the looks of it, which is good. So uh, let us know. If you do pick one up, pop us a message, put, us, put it up on Instagram or some other social channel of your choice and tag us in and let us know that you picked up a bottle because that's always exciting. That we The whole point of what we do, right, is to introduce people to, whether it's you, Vin, who's drunk far more whiskey than a person should, or <laughs> people who are more amateurs uh, that are our customers and are just kind of getting into the world of whiskey like the whole point is to sort of explore things it's still my favorite way to drink whiskey is to try them mm -hmm. alongside this and, and try new things um so that's the whole point it's always really exciting when people actually go ahead and, uh, and buy a bottle because it means that what we do has worked um which is really gratifying um yeah absolutely we go? i think um for me first of all vin a big thank you to you for for hosting and making all the tech with around so capably 
Um, thank you to Harry for not only choosing the whiskies um, that were in the box tonight, but for um, doing all the prep on the cards and things like that and liaising with all the brands and then for hanging out here in the chat tonight and chipping in. Thanks, Dave, for joining us from, from Boutique. Really good to have you there and dropping some knowledge gems for us. And thanks to everyone who, who joined the chat as well. It's really nice to have people drop in and share drama with us. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, thanks to you, Chris, for, for even doing these boxes in the first place, because it's, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's... It, five years now. <laughs> five years then, nearly. No, not quite. Four and a half, I think we're at, but uh, we're getting on for five years. We'll have to do a shiny edition for the five-year anniversary. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's probably coming up in sort of like, what's that, uh, Augusty time, isn't it? Yeah, it'll um, be uh sort of yeah it depends on the account the, the date or the sort of i guess what's five times 12 the 60th box uh i suppose yeah well, we did once or twice skip a month so it's like, probably we'll go for the date because we haven't quite kept true to the posting schedule the whole five years um yeah, yeah maybe that's the, that's the right time for our next shiny edition is when we get to sort of the five-year anniversary and the five-year anniversary of your channel as well i would have seen yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a bit of a weird one because I started in in the May, but um, that when I say started, I I sat down in front of a camera for the first time in May, but it wasn't until August that I had a logo and I started doing weekly videos and things like that. So that's when I start my, you know, official. But yeah, four, uh, I'll be coming up to five years as well, which is crazy, crazy. And hey, subscribers! So we've we've actually given some shout outs to to Whisk Guy and other people tonight, but do check out Vin's videos. If you're, if you're new to whiskey, if you're quite experienced, it's got a lot of really good reviews. Um, every now and then he unboxes a dram team box. So I pop over on his channel and we do this. Uh, so that's no nonsense whiskey on, on YouTube and social, right? Yeah. Yeah. No nonsense whiskey on, on pretty much everything apart from Twitter when I'm NN whiskey. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a, been a tough, uh, half year cause uh, I had, a, I had a baby last year. So it's, uh, we've, we've, we've not done as many of these as we should have, but, um, getting back on track i think definitely getting back on track with it well you've got yourself lucky you've got yourself a sleeper it's always good <laughs> with the first shard isn't it if they sleep right well talking of sleep it's nearly my bedtime here mate so um thank you very much especially after having a few whiskeys I'm, I'm definitely uh ready for some sweet dreams um so thank you everyone for popping into the chat and uh yeah let's do this for the next shiny edition and actually vin you'll be joining us behind the scenes in march mm -hmm. i won't in part of that tasting, uh, Harry will be taking the the spotlight there with all the the people who've got involved in the brands as well. So look out for that. If you're a subscriber or not, that will be we'll be making an extra in in March for that charity event, and we're doing it such that um, by working with the brands and so on, we're going to be able to donate a good amount of money from the from the from the um, proceeds of that box to um, to charities, which is really good. So it's our first experiment with that. But uh, so look out for that. Um, I think we'll have it up on the site in the next few days. We'll be announcing it a bit early because it's of, of the event and so on. So um, you'll see that soon online, I'm sure. Definitely. Well, yeah, I mean, it's been a really good chat. Really good. I'm going to finish off these um, downstairs once I turn all the studio lights off and, and have a little chill out. But yeah. um, I'm, I'm really glad to have tried this set because it's uh, it's been eye opening, definitely, for sure. Well, I'm glad. That's the point. Well, thank you very much, Vin, and thanks everyone else. And uh, we'll see you again for another tasting in, in due course, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Great. everyone, for joining us. Um, yeah. We'll catch you again. Cheers. See you.